Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Jaffrey Civic Center. I'm Joe Steinfield, and I'm the moderator of the Stories to Share program. And as I look around, many of you have been here repeatedly right from the beginning. This is the fourth program of the second season, but we also have some newcomers here today, and we have people uh, joining us remotely. So whether or no weather, we're good to go. I spoke with Steve a few days ago, and I said, you know, there's talk about the weather. And his response was, who cares about the weather? <laughs> and of course, I don't know Steve well, but I'm getting to, and I think that typifies someone whom many of you know. As I was watching a few minutes ago, I thought I was at an old home week here. <laughs> and I've known for quite a while that having Steve who really is a citizen of Jaffrey, uh, would attract a large turnout. He came here not by accident, he tells me, uh, back in the 90s, and New England Wood Pellet has been a great success, uh, although he points out to me there's more to me than wood pellets, <laughs> as we will hear. He sold the company and has gone on to other ventures that we will hear about. It's rare that you can have a conversation with someone and get such wonderful quotes, and I'll just give you a couple of them. One having to do with today's talk is, it is so important to get off fossil fuel and create a sustainable economy, and it's not just about climate change, it is about a more resilient and less expensive economy. He also told me, this is my favorite quote from our conversation, I love talking about energy. And that's what he is going to do. It's a great pleasure to have all of you here and to introduce someone whom I think you could call an idealistic entrepreneur, Steve Walker. Thanks. Thanks so much for that introduction. And Jaffrey does have a very special place in my heart. And I didn't end up here um, by accident. And, and actually, Peter Davis, who is here in the crowd, which I did not expect to see, um, was the guy that recruited me here, if you remember, and also didn't let me leave. So the, um, uh, we came up here years ago with a, with a single um, uh, employee a very small company and a combination of the town of Jaffrey, a keen economic development group, and uh, the utility at the time, public service in New Hampshire, um, was recruiting businesses up here. And uh, Peter in particular, he, he, he was the guy uh, that, that, that drew us in here. We looked at this messed up sawmill in, on Route 137, and it was a rainy day, and there was a little less rain in the building than outside of the building. And, um, and, uh, and that became our first home here. And, and uh, years later, we grew the business to be 350 times the size uh, th uh, when I had stepped down. And uh, then it has since grown many, many times bigger than that to become uh, possibly the largest bioenergy company in the United States. So it, um, it, it was a real success. I was glad to uh, move on, though, and I'll, I'll explain more about that. Um, uh, right now. Um, so uh, just to, uh, to cap what we're going to talk about here is just a, a little bit of a history of me. I was told to talk about that. I usually just like strictly talking about energy, but the good news here is that I can't talk about anything, even my childhood, without talking about energy, so it's still going to be about that. Um, uh, this is kind of a big deal here. I want to introduce just a different way of thinking about energy. One of the things that, that, that the goals here is to have you walk out of here learning something and feeling a lot more in control over what is about to happen. We're going through a huge energy transition right now. I don't know that everyone totally appreciates it, but it's as big as what we went through in 1900. And everything is about to change. Everything is changing. And there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of bad information. There's a lot of good information. I'm, I hope to, ho hope to put a little sense to some of that. Um, 
the other thing is, you know, what am I working on now? I, it was 10 years ago, I um, stepped down from the pellet company uh, voluntarily. Uh, and, uh, and then it was only one year after that, unsolicited, uh, uh, it was unsolicited that a company, a public company came in and, and took it over and, and um, grew it from there. And they, they offered more money than all of us thought maybe it was worth. So they, they then owned it. That's the way business works. And, um, uh, and then, um, the, but the, the, uh, what, what I am, uh, what, what can be done too? We want to talk about what can be done, like just to give yourselves a little bit of power, uh, no pun intended, to, to, to try to help yourselves, but also help the greater economy in this. And then finally, um, finally, we're stalled here. Questions. Uh, so, um, at any rate, um, moving forward. So, what got me interested in energy? Um, it, it, there was a, you know, I started at a really bizarrely young age, being interested in in, in energy. And the first thing I'm going to talk about here, you're going to wonder, like, what the heck has this got to do with energy? But just 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 follow me here. Um, dyslexia. Um, so I'm dyslexic, really dyslexic, like off the charts, literally in an HBO documentary on the subject. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, what, what, is, what, is, what does that mean? Well, well it, it meant school was, was, was pretty, pretty brutal. I, I, I really did not like school. Um, school kind of liked me, but it was probably a little frustrated and challenged by me. Um, I was a nice kid. I always got along with teachers, et cetera, showed up on time, what have you. Um, but uh, reading was almost impossible. And um, so as a child, it was really, really, really difficult. Um, it gave me a healthy um, sort of, um, I don't want to call it distrust, but, uh, but I definitely look at systems like schools and just challenge how they're doing things. Um, as an adult, what does it mean? Um, I'm still incredibly poor reader. It would just be like, it, I have a complete vocabulary. Um, it'd be like if I took you into a dark room gave you something to read with print that's just big enough so you could read it and say, go. Y you know, you could just, you know, like the menu when you go in and for some of us that are not young, you know, you kind of, I mean, um, that's what it feels like with all the light and all the optics in the world. It's just really painful to get through. So I, I avoid it like the plague. The good news is, is I suck up images like crazy. It's the other side of dyslexia, everyone tries to focus on the negatives is there's two, two really important things about it. One is um, you can get really get into three-dimensional spatial understanding. So like I can put together three-dimensional models in my head like crazy and I always assume everyone could do that. Turns out they can't. Um, so I can have things moving around in my head. I can be talking to you and having things, putting together things, designing things. There, there was this uh, show, The Queen's Gamut or something like that and this young woman was playing chess on the ceiling and and my wife was there saying, wow, that's amazing. I'm like, <laughs> so uh, I'm no chess player, but like, of course, that's what you do. Um, and, and so the, the, um, it's just a, it's a different way of thinking. So one is that, that three-dimensional. The other, the other is a little harder to explain. Um, but this is a common trait, and it's well studied. I've worked with quite a bit with Stanford um, University on this in years past. Uh, they're testing me, trying to understand how the brain works along with other people that they consider have done, you know, successful things in life. And, and, um, uh, and that is just looking at complex systems and, and just, just like automatically understanding them. So you have all the parts and pieces of these systems and you just get it immediately. And so I'm always frustrated by people who don't see it all. And sometimes it's really hard to communicate what you see when no one else is seeing it. Um, kind of like if someone could never visually see and you're trying to explain a sunset. It's just a very complicated, a little, little, little more uh, to it than someone who, who, who is normally could see a sunset. So, um, so I, I, I'll explain this a little bit more as it goes on, but it turns out that dyslexic, like, um, oh, it's somewhere between one third and one half of all the companies started in the United States are by someone who is dyslexic. Another good example is George Lucas. Um, which is financially one of the most successful people in, in you know, he was one of the wealthiest people in the world uh, who created Star Wars. Um, and and um, that, that just reeks of everything, I think. Like when you see a Star Wars movie, these complicated machines and all this stuff going in and spaceships flying inside of other spaceships and all this stuff. I can tell you right now, that guy could do that all in his head. I, I don't know him, 
But it wouldn't surprise me at all. The hard part is communicating to the rest of the world because you've got this huge reservoir of all this stuff in a different way of thinking than most people, and you've got this little tiny straw, I like to think of it as, and that's the English language, and somehow you've got to get it from here out to there, and if you push too hard, it tends to spray, and no one knows what the heck you're talking about. So there's real positives to it and a real advantage to business and a real advantage to understanding an energy system that is very, very complicated. Um, the other thing was growing up in the energy crisis of the 70s. So um, I, um, as, as I can see, a lot of people here got to experience that and some people here have no idea what I'm talking about. The, the, um, um, I'll just, I'm going to work towards two, two visuals on this. So one to the younger people here, they, they, that there was, a uh, real issue with uh, gasoline in particular. And, and uh, so they had this oil embargoes and all this other stuff going on. And, and I just remember as a kid, you know, this Gran Torino station wagon, I think it was a 1973, um, a real symbol of poor use of energy. And, and, um, and, you know, you had this odd number on the license plate days you'd go to get gasoline. Well, that's if they had gasoline. You know, like we like to complain about the gas prices, especially a few months ago, y unless you're driving an electric car. And, and the, the um, um, but I mean, back then it was like, you may not get gas at the gas station at any price. And so, so it was, it was really, uh, really kind of scary as a kid. And um, my job uh, when we did this, so one of, one of the strategies is you, you would obviously, as soon as you get a phone call from your neighbor saying, hey, they got gas and you'd, I guess, fly down there and you're thinking, I, my job of being the oldest kid um, it was to hold on to the extra gas tanks that they bring along and, and, and fill. And so I'll just paint the visual here. Um, me sitting in the back of the station wagon, no seat belt, no seat, um, <laughs> facing backwards, two basic bombs that I'm holding on to with leaking leaded gas um, bubbling out of the cork that didn't quite fit uh, for our extra fuel um, to, to get home. I, I can only imagine if a cop pulled over that situation today, what would happen. Um, the, the other got into... Um, wood burning, so, so my parents made the decision to uh, get a wood stove, and, and which I thought was really cool. So no, now I loved mechanical things and anything working, I was constantly pulling things apart in the house. I was one of those kids and you know, occasionally getting it put back together. And, and the, the, uh, they were gonna get this wood stove and I was very excited by this. To, to, to kind of my shock is the, the, the wood stove showed up and it was made out of metal. I, I kind of had this thing in my head, it was made out of wood. And of course, once I saw it was made out of steel, it answered a lot of questions. Uh, I, I was like, wow, and I, I, this, this is absolutely true. So, so the, 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 uh, the, the, we, you know, the next part of wood stoves is the wood part. And, and so my uh, parents, and, and, and now my mother's in the audience as it turns out, so maybe sh I should just blame my father. The um, bought this lift of wood, so it comes full log length. And you know, I'm at the tender age of something like uh, you know, I was in grade school. And um, he then gets this Sears and Craftsman chainsaw, and this damn thing was louder than Harley Davidson. And and he was not a mechanical guy. I don't know where I came from, mom, but it wasn't him. And, and like he didn't know the difference between a screwdriver and a chisel, and he kind of used them interchangeably. It was it was ugly. So he's got this chain, so I couldn't get the thing going. So I kind of fooled with it, got it going. Young, I was like this tall. And, and um, so he out there cuts a couple things of wood. Next thing you know, he turns to me and said, hey, you want to try? I mean, he, he, he saw me as forced labor. And so I started cutting this wood. So next image I want to give you is this young kid on top of a big, huge log pile, which was very unstable, with a chainsaw, with no safety anything on it. And then he, the only thing he gave me these, these huge, ridiculous goggles that were like, it looked like you're ready to go scuba diving. And they fogged up, I couldn't see anything, so I wore those on my head. <laughs> and I had the straps hanging down, and, and I'm in there, and I'm cutting this stuff away. And I, you know, once again, if you saw this at your neighbor's house right now, what would you do? So it left quite an impact, but it, it doesn't end there. So, so, so with, um, with the next um, uh, part of this, we, we, uh, we ended up, uh, you got to, you know, run the wood stove. Um, my, my, um, so you gotta cut it, then split it, then stack it, then bring it into the darn wood stove. And um, I was still pretty excited about this. But then my father, he took me to this energy show, he told me it'd be an energy show. Well, it turned out it was a home show, most of which was boring as hell for me, but, but the, there was energy components to it. And, you know, we're getting weather stripping and all this other stuff. Um, 
one of the things, you know, this little thermostat he bought. Now, I knew a lot about energy. I knew a lot about our boilers and how it worked in the house. Again, this is the stuff I love to study. The, um, I'm driving home with him, and I said, you know, pulling out this thermostat, I'm like, how does a thermostat? Now, this, this is not Nest. This isn't something you can program. This is just on-off thermostat, and I was just very confused by this. Now, this is a guy that, you know, studied to be an accountant. Energy was not what he understood. He said, just look at it and see if you can figure it out. And it was like a panic attack. I looked at this damn thing, and, and, and this is where the dyslexic head comes in. I go, one, this thing turns down to 45, and, and the other ones just went down to 55. So I knew it went down to 45, and I also knew I was in the one room he liked to complain the most about. Now, like, I was four years old when I was put in that room. This is not my fault. I had nothing to do with designing this room. I had a room that had, you know, unheated floor in the garage, unheated separate part of the attic, four walls to the outside. Um, he had just decided it's my fault that that thing takes so much energy, so I knew where that thermostat was going to go. <laughs> and, and sure enough, uh, there it goes. Two weeks later, all the pipes freeze um, because, you know, if you go from 55 down to 45, you've now cut out half the delta between the freezing point um, and, 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 and the uh, temperature that room was trying, struggling to be at before. And um, so the pipes ruptured, blew out the ceiling in the garage. I'm looking at this total mess. Looks like a bomb went off knowing I'm not going to have any heat in my room this winter, am I? And, and mom, she agreed. Uh, that's pretty much where we're heading. So on the cold days, I'm in um, uh, my room. It, it gets well below freezing. Um, I would just grab a pillow and a blanket and go down by that wood stove. Well, well, of course, the wood stove only lasts about two hours. So I'm up every two hours going out, getting more wood, restoking the wood stove, and going in. So here I am showing up to grade school, dyslexic, and completely catatonic from getting no sleep. It wasn't a great way to go through school. Um, um, then wood pellets. So fast forward 10 years, uh, uh, 15 years, and 23 years old at this time, and, and um, I was building robotic equipment. I've had a lot of businesses, so I never actually worked for a paycheck from anybody, and it wasn't like I didn't need to make money. I just always had my own business, lawn mowing, landscaping, construction, tree work, whatever you can imagine. Well, one of them was robotics. I know that doesn't quite fit with the others. But I, uh, one of the company, one of the, my clients said, hey, have you ever seen a wood pellet stove? So I went over there and I uh, went to this little stove shop and they just brought it in, new concept, and they were bringing these pellets in from Montana. And I, I just, it, I, I was like, love at first sight. I, I, I really was, and I couldn't believe it. It just, every neuron, and this is where the brain starts getting in. I'm like connecting all the dots. I'm like, holy cow, automatic feed. This is using waste wood, because I had one of my clients uh, was a wood processing company, and so I knew how much waste wood they had, and they always had problems getting rid of it. Uh, landfills were starting to not take the wood anymore uh, because of laws that, you know, appropriately were saying you can't do this. So we, um, um, that seemed great. All of it just seemed amazing, and then I saw that, you know, this stuff is coming from Montana, and I'm like, you know, I immediately, the logistics, and it's like, wow, trucks are really expensive, and, and coming all the way from there, and, and it just immediately decided this is what I want to do uh, within a half hour, um, so, so um, Optimus. And, and so I, I then I uh, went literally that night, went into my basement, made a bunch of dyes. I had a whole lab in my house. And so I'm in the microscope, I'm trying to put water in this stuff and alcohol and everything else, trying to figure out what the heck it is, how they put it together. And um, I made some little wood pellets that night. I, I, did, I didn't sleep a bit. Went right back over to the wood stove shop with this little cup of pellets. This guy was just like, who is this freak? And, and I, I'm like, I made them last night. He's like, I'm sure you made them last night. <laughs> and we put them in the stove and it all worked. And, Lo and behold, I'm like, yep, this is it. This is what we're going to do. So I, I marched up to a grain company um, in Bow, New Hampshire, that made rabbit food. I'm like, it looks almost the same. <laughs> and and they, they, they th then taught me how, you know, like this whole process work. I go, this is cool. Um, then I started getting prices of the machinery, and I'm like, ooh, okay, this is more expensive than a lawnmower. And, and so we found some used equipment, and I cobbled up whatever bit of money I had, and we uh, repainted and pulled this stuff. I was literally going to dump heaps. I went down to a feed mill, and they had the trash heap, and I said, I think you have a machine I need. And he's like, oh, I know, but it doesn't work. I was fine. I got it. I'll fix it. Did that kind of thing to, to, to shoehorn this thing together. Um, so here I am, um, just 
a year after that point in time, got a whole little tree put together, and in 1983 started producing pellets in Acton, Massachusetts. Um, this factory then uh, uh, was, you know, worked pretty well. Um, it turned out I figured out how to make pellets. I hadn't quite mastered the art of making money at making pellets. And so that got a little tricky, and I managed, and this is where Peter Davis and all these other people come in. I had this great idea. Look, I just need a bigger factory. You know, bigger always solves everything, right? And, and uh, but in this case, it did. And, and we, we went in, and uh, we were able to put together money from through Keene. The town of Jaffrey put their neck on the line for this business, by the way, and I'll never forget that. And we were put together, I forget, it was like three or $400,000, which to me was just this insane amount of money. But that's what we needed. And you see over there in 1985, that was me standing with actually one of the co-investors. It was one of my landscape customers that um, it's actually his wife that was the one that put the money in. I think he was looking at this going, what did she do with our money? <laughs> and it and, um, uh, turned out to be a really good investment, by the way. <laughs> the, the, uh, 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 and this is our new machine here on Route 137 in Jaffrey, where the, for those that are from this town, the Heartline Stove Shop is. That's where we originally set up. Um, well, that was great. We, 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 we started going here, and, and we were making product, and we were making a little bit of money. It, it started becoming bankable, so debt finance started coming in, and we could, it kept expanding it there. The, we had one problem, though. We were kind of in this quirky zoning there. There was residents around there, which were being really kind to me, but saying, you know, you know this whole thing, we kind of hear that running a little past the hours of operation you're supposed to be running. I said, yeah, I know. Well, I'm trying to meet orders. And Occurred to me real quickly, I, I got to run this thing 24 hours a day. We weren't zoned for it. So that's where Peter Davis here, sorry to keep picking on you here, but you're here. Uh, he came to me and I said, look, I, I got to find another property. And I found all these in different towns. He said, no, 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 let me fix this. And, and uh, so he found a piece of property over uh, on, on Old Sharon Road. Um, uh, there was only a couple minor details. We didn't have a bridge to get to it and a couple other things. We had to back 18 wheelers across that. And he said, no, 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 we'll fix all that, trust me. And I trusted him. It worked, you got a new bridge in there. I, 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 it, was, it was a beautiful thing. But for the first couple of years, we had to um, back trucks over. <laughs> the, the, uh, I had one problem though, it, like when you start taking this waste stream, they then gave up the landfills they were going to and they lost their licenses to put them there. And so it became really important that I kept moving their sawdust. And this stuff was dusty, hence the dust part in sawdust. And uh, you can't just like pile it anywhere. It makes a big, huge mess. So it was really important. I couldn't shut this plant down. It became kind of like a real coordinated issue. And this is again with a sort of dyslexic mind kicks in, created this very elaborate system in three weeks to move an entire factory across town. So everything was going great. I had everything planned uh, to a T. We had uh, all kinds of trucks and, and, and rigging companies and everything we needed to move that thing, electricians, et cetera. We had, gotten foundations, built a building on the other side of town, and we're ready for the big move. But I had one monster, monster problem that we got stuck with. I had these silos, and I just bought these silos, and I didn't finance enough to buy new silos. These are really expensive things, by the way. They stood four or five stories tall in the air, and big, huge um, storage things, and we really need them. We can't operate the plant without them. And I um, went to take them apart, and, and it turns out they don't come apart. They, they screw them together. These are mastic stuff. We couldn't undo it. And I called the factory, and they're like, oh, no, you're never going to get those things apart. And I said, great. Um, so, so I go, uh, so I looked at, okay, well, we can pick them up, turn them sideways, we'll get them down the road that way. Well, they're two stories tall on their side. So um, once I got done with public service in New Hampshire, all the phone companies, they said, well, this will be about a six month permitting process. We got to take the lights down. We got to take all the lights down in the center, the center of town, the traffic lights down. We're going to have to designate 14 different services. We got high voltage lines that have got to be pushed up. You know, the whole thing just turned into this nightmare and it, it was just like in total panic mode. So. You know, this is again where kind of it helps in business to have this sort of dyslexic head that just puts everything together. And I remember seeing a movie, a military thing, and they had helicopters picking up um, tanks and loading them onto stuff. So we flew the silos over to this other side of the town. So we, <laughs> we, we got a helicopter, and I started calling around. I, first, I had a friend of mine that was a helicopter pilot. I go, how much did your helicopter pick up? And he said about 800 pounds, and I'm like, 
Oh boy, that's not even close. And I said, does anyone make a helicopter that can pick up, let's say, 20,000? And, and um, turns out there was a company in, in, um, in uh, uh, Pennsylvania that could do just that. Um, and, and I asked them, you know, like, how, mu how much does this helicopter cost? He said, about $220. And I'm like, oh, I, ca I can handle that a minute. And, and, <laughs> I, um, and, and you get to count the transportation from Pennsylvania. And I, I just said, oh, God. Um, all right, uh, at this point I had no choice, out of options. And the guy could sense the terror. And so I said, yeah, I think I can pull this off. But he said, well, we got Wildcat Mountain. They're going to be pouring a bunch of concrete. If you can line it up with them, I bet you they'll be real happy. You pay one way, I bet you they'll offer the other, and you split it, and we'll call it a day. Well, Wildcat and I, we all got together great, and they were psyched, and we were psyched, and we got the helicopter up there. 28 minutes of jet time, because that's how they timed it. We, we picked up... Uh, Three silos moving to the other side of town. We had to lie about this whole thing too to the town because the helicopter is not allowed to fly over persons or property. So they, they we set a fake startup time. Somehow a reporter got a hold of it though, uh, and and got a picture of that because they could not fly over anything that could have a person in it, um, and moved it over. And so that's the uh, uh, right there is is the um, uh, Jaffrey facility. Uh, and uh, we kept growing from there, kept tackling problems. So we ended up consuming too much sawdust. We couldn't have enough of that. So then we had to get into the wet sawdust. So we had to get this drying system. And so we put that in. Um, we had a few neighbor problems with the town of Sharon when I put that up because it looked like this massive tailpipe. It really was pretty harmless stuff, but it, but it, but it, it got a little sticky there. Governors got involved and everything else. It was a mess. We got through it. Um, we then kept expanding the company. We got into, uh, uh, into uh, New York, uh, and New York at the time was offering a lot of incentive, uh, as Jaffrey did. When I say that, you know, they were just trying to make it so it's not New York and acted a little bit more like New Hampshire, so we built a facility there. We built a another facility in Jaffrey just to build facilities, so we started designing and building all of our own machinery. Um, and and um, and that proved to be very successful. Uh, we then built a facility over in Deposit, New York, in 2010. Uh, Jaffrey was our core, though. That's where everything was happening. It was the nerve center of the company. Um, that's when I then um, stepped uh, down from it. Uh, it kept growing. It got acquired by this uh, public company. They then this company acquired our, uh, three of our largest competitors. Uh, and then that got acquired by another company. Now I think they have 25 facilities across uh, uh, the uh, U.S., northern U.S. for the most part, and southern Canada. Uh, so it's been quite a success story. Um, another important part of this is, is it consumes an enormous amount of what would be waste. Um, one of our Canadian facilities, we had directly shut down incinerators to turn everything into fuel. So there was a major carbon impact, and we got raided by the... Um, um, uh, EU because we sold some into Europe as, 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 as we got a better rating than solar energy did at the time for, for carbon because we ran our own energy systems um, and so we were very conscientious about emissions. Um, so this, this is the thing I'd like to talk about here is energy consumption. Um, when we talk about energy, so now I'm going to stop with the pellet company, we got that. Um, uh, and, and if you probably figured out now, I love just studying energy, understanding energy. Um, we're, we're missing a big point in the whole thing here going forward. And I mean everybody. I mean it, people that I know that it, like study energy don't see what I'm about to show you here, don't understand it. I can promise you the CEOs of the oil companies don't see this. Even some of the renewable energy companies don't quite understand this. The way we look at energy is like this. So we love to talk about energy source. So what are, what are we getting energy from? And this, this graph's a couple years old, so that renewable line's grown a bit and the coal line shrunk a bit. We're, we're, we're moving in the right direction. Um, and so we talk about all these sources. Where are we getting it and its impacts, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing we talk about is end use. So I've just broken this down very simply to show the three big parts. And those are to scale. Uh, we got a bunch of this goes into that to make electricity, to make transportation fuel, and heat. Um, and they're about equal thirds. Heat, heat is the largest third, if, if it's not an oxymoron. And, um, but this is the part no one appreciates. They'll kind of know it, it, but we haven't talked about this enough. And it is the bigger deal than I believe all of renewable energy will be combined. 
and that's energy uh, conversion. So what, so I'm not, don't worry, I'm not gonna get you into a physics lesson here. <laughs> the, 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 but all of this, if you think about it, like what's a gallon of gasoline do for you? Absolutely nothing. You have to put it in something to get anything useful out of it. And actually, even electricity, which you have to co first convert fuel into electricity by itself, if I brought a cord in, what are you gonna do with that? Absolutely nothing. You have to turn it into something, and that's conversion. Everything gets converted. And this is where I personally think things are gonna be really, really exciting. Um, the, um, I didn't know there was two clicks to that. The, the, uh, now you really see it. Um, so if you wanna know how my brain works, there it is. Um, so this is a slightly more complicated graph. Don't, don't worry, you don't have to memorize anything. But again, it's conversion. So I took some federal data and the way people were thinking about energy and just wanted to highlight. This actually was a chart we sent to Pelosi's office a couple years ago trying to get them to understand. They, were, they, they had a whole bunch of money that they wanted to move into energy and I was talked to by one of their top people about how, how you know, we, we can't do more with solar and wind right now, we need something else. They said, well, it's energy conversion. I mean, don't you guys see this? And, and um, so I, I, I created this graph, taking all the data they have and they're used to seeing and just trying to like carve out this energy conversion part of this to say, look, this is a big deal. You see the gray lines? Like all that energy has gone before anyone even gets to use it. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about insulation in your house here. I'm talking about like you just, you didn't even get the oil yet. You didn't, you didn't get the heat yet. You didn't get whatever pushes your car down the road yet. And actually that it grossly understates what energy conversion's power is. It is far, far more than that as we'll see in just a minute. So, you know, what exactly is energy conversion? So if we start with a, a pile of coal, and I'm just gonna pick coal because it's something you can see and touch, although probably uh, a lot, especially the younger crowd here, has probably never actually seen a piece of coal. Um, um, but we, so this could be any fuel, uh, fossil fuel or even renewable fuel. Um, we gotta convert it into something. So a power plant, you put it into a power plant and that does a conversion. The thing is with power plant, you actually have many, many layers of conversion within the power plant. They take the, the coal that gets converted into hot gas, the hot gas gets converted into water vapor, the water vapor gets heated up and created pressure. That thing gets converted again into work, that gets converted again into electricity, which then goes out of the plant. Um, the rest goes off in, in the form of heat, and, and, and I sort of, you have the blue clouds coming out of there, and the black clouds coming out of there. Um, most of it's coming out of the blue clouds, which is evaporating water. Another little fact here is 40% of the U.S. freshwater uh, consumption goes to power plants. It's as much as all of agriculture. Um, that's to get rid of the heat, to get rid of energy. And so we turn this into electricity, then we run over here and we run a light bulb, and that's yet another energy conversion device that takes that electricity that has no use by itself and turns it into something useful, and that's light. Let me just put a couple numbers to this, and of course, with the light, as we know, especially the old incandescent lights, they're very hot. Um, the, um, so I'm gonna just use some numbers. So these are energy coins, not money coins. Um, so so it, it's a kind of a weird number, 156, follow me on this. Very simple math to anyone who's scared of math. This is going to be easy. Um, the, uh, so we, we take a pile of coal. We then put it into a power plant. When we come out of that power plant, we now have gone from 156 to 50 coins. 68% of the energy has literally gone out through the stack. Now, those coins still exist, but they're now totally useless to anybody, and they're out in the atmosphere and gone. Um, so these energy coins are now worth quite a bit more than these energy coins because it's a more valuable uh, kind of, but we've lost all of that. The next step is making light. There's a 98% loss in light bulb. This is a traditional old light bulb you used to get right here at Bell Tate's two years ago, or uh, t 10 years ago. Um, uh, you now have LED, and we're gonna show what happens. And this is why I say energy conversion is important. So the gray are energy conversion points, and we see we went from 156 to one. Imagine if your stock portfolio did that. So. <laughs> So let's say I take a whole nother thing and you're gonna start getting it. We're always gonna end up at one, so that's really easy. Now we're starting with only nine. We're gonna start with natural gas. So I'm still talking about fossil fuel here. I'm a huge renewable energy person, but it's important to just recognize what we're dealing with right now. So today's energy is mostly going through a natural gas power plant. They've got a few tricks up their sleeve and it. By the way, it can be oil, it can be a lot of things, just not coal, but any uh, 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 
liquid or gaseous fuel, we can convert a much better rate. So it's 45% loss instead of the 68. So now we're down to five energy coins. And then we go to the LED light. And that is a much more efficient light bulb. And now we get our same exact amount of light at one. Um, so this is my point. We go from 156 to nine. And this goes from 20-year-old technology to just last decade's technology. I'm not even talking about new technology yet. So with a new technology, we can, um, did you, you may not know that there's LED lights now available that double the efficiency of these lights. And more than likely, when you go down to Bell Tate's local hardware store here, that's what's going to be on their shelves soon. You can go buy them if you hunt for them right now. Um, um, but that's going to get even better. So that cuts it in half again. And then the power plants, we can go to cogen systems. So if we want to still stick with the concept of using fuel, haven't talked about wind and solar yet, that, that we, we can cut in half again too. So we can drop this almost to a quarter again. And so that's why I say, you know, obviously whatever we do with renewable energy is going to be a much smaller part of the equation when you look at these numbers than the energy conversion devices. Let's give another example though. Now let's talk about, um, we start with crude oil. We go to a 15% loss here, which looks tiny now. You're saying, well, this is a pretty efficient operation. Once again, you wouldn't want to see that on your stock portfolio. We still lose a lot of energy. This is hundreds of billions of dollars of energy get lost just in this set so process. But this is where it gets crazy. And actually, that number is 85%, not 75. That was just a misprint. Um, uh, so only 15% of that uh, gasoline, so we go from crude oil to gasoline, we lose some, to what pushes the car. I'm not getting into what size car it is or how many people are in it. This is just what pushes the car, the physics of it. So it's, it's an eight to one. So we've lost, I mean, this is still horrendous. Um, but then we go to what today's technology is, is electricity. So now let's start with natural gas. And we can start with 2.1. Then we go to this same power plant we were making for the light bulb. We go to 1.2. And then we go to propulsion. Electric motor is only a 15% loss. Now that actually includes all the battery too. The, the motors themselves are extremely efficient. One of the nice things about electricity is you can go through, a, don't confuse con conversions as necessarily, you have to by definition, definition lose some energy, but it doesn't have to be a huge amount. Um, so battery, electric, the whole powertrain in an electric car, you have a very small loss. So again, we go from eight to 2.1 and, and um, they're pretty, pretty dramatic. So this, again, just conversion technology, so they're doing this. I, I haven't talked about renewables yet. So then we um, take the last example here, and that's going to be heating. So we take crude oil, same thing. We go over here, and you run your boiler. So we got a 1.7 to 1 in a typical oil um, boiler, and that's, a, I think, a 30. We got a couple numbers that I changed last second. Um, um, the... Um, Gas. Now you're going to see something really interesting here. Now one thing is you can't create or destroy energy, and you know I'm going to end up at one, but I'm starting with less than one. So you're going to say like, how the heck am I doing this? Um, go through the same power plant. So now we go down to 0.4 of a coin of this is this is an amount of energy um, to a heat pump, and in a heat pump we're able to actually pull energy. So so this device is throwing it into the atmosphere. A heat pump can pull it out of the atmosphere. So this is a device that just simply allows you to pull it out of the atmosphere. This is pretty cool. So again, we go from 1.7 units of energy to do the same exact job as 0.7 units. You see this precipitous drop. Again, fossil fuel to fossil fuel here. And, and by the way, that could be gas, that could be oil. You could, it's interchangeable. I'm just sort of putting what the standard is. Um, really, really dramatic. Um, once again, massive improvements can be made on this. We can drop the uh, conversion of this electricity in half again. And as I'm going to discuss a little bit more, we can make that heat pump a lot better than it is today. It turns out that that heat pump, um, it, on average right now, are only 15% the efficiency of what they can be. Um, you're probably starting to figure out what I'm working on next. Um, so. Um, conversion technologies, they're going to continue to advance, and I think we're going to drop precipitously from what I just showed you, absent of any, any renewable energy at all. But of course, we have all kinds of renewable energy coming in. Most of them are in the form of electricity, so that's going to further dramatically reduce the amount of fuels we need of any kind. To the point that I would say that if we just keep moving this forward just on the same path that is, 
We're not going to need any, 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 anything new. It, it, it's already done. Like technologically, we've finished. Now, it, that doesn't mean we won't want to keep reinvesting. Now, heat pumps, it's not a great name. So we think of a heat pump as something that heats, but a heat pump is also what's in your refrigerator. It's also what's in your car for your air conditioning. It's in your window air conditioner. So it does both cooling and heating. It's just pulling heat out of something or, or, or putting it into something. This is the guy that invented it in Buffalo, New York. You might say, How can I, you know, you'd think it would be from someone from, let's say, Florida, um, that would invent an air conditioner because that's, that's what they were used for uh, first. Um, but it turns out it wasn't for air conditioning space. It was for air conditioning uh, paper in New York City. Uh, printing presses had a terrible time with humidity in the summer. And so that's, what, well, that's how the air conditioner, as we know it, got developed by Willis Carrier. Um, turned out to be a pretty smart guy. He, th th he has, there's 50,000 employees right now working at this company making air conditioners, and they're not the biggest one. 20% of global electricity goes into these devices right now, and that, that by some very credible groups are saying could be 40 to 50% of global electricity consumption will be going through uh, what, uh, what you could call in the bigger term a heat pump. Now, why don't we heat with heat pumps right now? Um, there's some problems with them. Um, they, they work pretty well in, in this thermometer over here in green, you'll see you have really efficient heating if you're, let's say, at a, a above freezing. They, they work quite well. It has nothing to do with the freezing mark. It's just an easy thing to remember. Um, you can go a little below that. So they both cost less to operate and, um, uh, and are more efficient in kind of any, any term. The problem is, is it gets a little colder. Their efficiency keeps dropping. They, you got to think of it like an elevator in the the higher a lift it's making from the cold side to the hot side, the more energy they use. Well, at some point it ends up costing more, and then they just plain shut off. And in New Hampshire here, you know, we still do get that cold. Um, and, and, uh, and, and people don't want heat most of the time. They need heat all of the time. And so these have just been very poor sellers. 90% of the heat pumps used for heating in the United States get sold in the southern half of the United States, and only 10 in the north. Most of those are really air conditioners with little shoulder heating, or let's put it in the new living room because this could work out pretty well. The solution that we've been working on is, is a heat pump that, that addresses that problem. Now, Carrier has 4,500 engineers working for it, and we've got about 20, and so you're kind of like, okay, so how do these guys figure it out, and they didn't. And by the way, Carrier, as I said, is just one of many, many huge companies. This is a very big industry. The largest company making uh, air conditioning uh, systems and, or heat pumps is in um, in China, and they're about the size of General Motors in any metric you could imagine. Employees, over 100,000 employees, et cetera. Um, big, big, big industry. So how could this little startup do anything? Well, again, this is where the dyslexic mind comes in. You just got to think differently. <laughs> and um, so, um, so where are, are really, 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 really smart people, and, and how can we solve this problem? And it literally was one night, and I, you know, just being a science guy and kind of geeky that way, yeah, I had a monocular. I was out in a, in a really dark area of, um, of Martha's Vineyard, and I was looking up at the moon and you know planets and this, that, and the other thing, and the International Space Station happened to come right through the view, which I was really excited by. And it just dawned on me, again, the dyslexic brain going, holy cow, how the heck do they heat and cool that thing? And I, I always thought it was just a heating problem because like, space is cold, right? Well, it turns out it's actually the opposite. It's when the sun hits something up there, it's ugly. And they actually have to have really intense cooling systems. So I researched the heck of this, got the European Space Agency, like, how do you guys cool this? Who builds your HVAC systems? Like, how, how do you do this? I'm pretty sure it's not a carrier unit. <laughs> and um, it turns out I was right. Um, it, it, um, uh, they, they use a totally different technology. And, it's, and, and ironically, it turns out to be the technology that Willis Carrier originally invented. He then moved quickly to some other technology because at the time you couldn't make what he had invented work. Really important to go back to these original really smart inventors and understand exactly what they were working on. Um, I think you'd be really excited about what um, is happening here in space and what is now we're hoping to deliver to homes. Uh, we're working with a lot of really smart people with NASA, Department of Energy, and Purdue University, and that company over there, Creari, is it turns out very conveniently the number one supplier of uh, energy systems for um, uh, NASA is right here in New Hampshire. And uh, so we have partnered with them to take that technology and, and move it into our homes. What we have is a next generation system here, and I'm not selling anything, nothing is for sale, so we're just explaining what we're working on. 
Uh, we're not there yet. Um, but we basically, if we can double the efficiency of this, this is going to be much cheaper than gas and oil. It's going to provide air conditioning at half the, uh, at half the energy. Um, this will include domestic hot water. Um, the, the, uh, uh, it will com connect to your existing system. So one of the things we had to come up with is, is the current heat pumps can't quite get hot enough to just go right into your pipes in your house. So we've, uh, with the NASA unit, they have no problems with that. So NASA, by the way, they're using the, the, the temperatures on most of these satellites that are, uh, um, I think, Earth orbital, um, uh, learning a lot of space uh, things. They, they vary from minus 450 degrees at night and then 15 minutes later, because that's pretty much a day for a satellite, uh, you can hit 1,500 degrees. Uh, actually, it's that Celsius uh, get up over two, way over 2,000 degrees uh, during the day. So an astronaut, um, they have to have really intense cooling systems or they become fried chicken. Um, another option we're putting in here, I've been working with NASA, is, uh, is they're working on planetary uh, energy systems and they've allowed us to work with them on that. So we've got a parallel uh, partnership with them and they're developing the same engine we're developing um, to be able to take renewable fuels uh, and convert that to electricity at about eight times the efficiency of your traditional uh, backup generator. And we could just bundle that right into the same unit. So when the power goes out, this will work. Not only that, it can help charge your phones, maybe charge a car. It depends how big a unit you want to put in there uh, and, and keep your lives going all in one package. So we're just looking at this as an entire engine unit, just like my brain works. It's putting everything together in one package so you don't have all these different, you know, we've got water heaters and boilers and things. It's just one unit to take care of all your energy uh, needs in the house. Um, so I'll run through this very quickly. So what can society do? Um, uh, so I'm going to talk about what individuals can do. So but first, like, what do we need to, to focus on? We need to take the cost-effective technologies we already have and just get them into place. And I think right now it's not a case of like our government uh, incentivizing. It's our getting our government to getting our government to, to to reduce barriers that were not intentionally put there but are there to move these forward. Just replace the old technologies with new technologies as fast as we possibly can. Continue to expand solar and wind the way they are, and I put in 10 to 15 years. So. You know, anytime you're talking about the future, it's an opinion, right? It's not a fact. But, but, but what I like to work with is many facts as possible. If you take the current growth rate, the last 10-year growth rate, just take the curve and continue it on. In 10 to 15 years, we're going to have enough wind and solar and other renewables to cover the entire system. Um, that, that's a fact. Um, whether it keeps growing on that curve, that's uh, who knows. Uh, but that's the trend. Uh, it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, we need to continue to moving waste streams. We, we still throw out, the average household, by the way, throws out just about as much stuff that does not get recycled in energy value as you use in electricity. So there's an enormous amount of waste and there's advanced ways of doing this that are much, much cleaner than a landfill or, or, or an incinerator. Um, continue to invest in new uh, technologies. I, because I say it's done, don't, don't, don't mean we can't, I mean, it's silly to stop. Like, we need to double down on investments in new technologies. So fusion, we know uh, a lot of that. Uh, it was a big, big announcement a couple weeks ago on that. Look, d don't expect that to be helping you out here in the next decade or two, as they also admit, uh, but we need to keep doing that. And finally, and I'd love to add a lot of expletives here, but I'm not going to do it because I'm on say I don't know who's watching this. But we just stop subsidizing fossil fuel. Like I hear politicians talk about, you know, well, we're, we're, you know we got to work with renewables and they're being subsidized. It, it is absolutely inconceivable that renewables will ever get the amount of total subsidies. Inconceivable that that could possibly happen. They could start giving away solar panels uh, by the U.S. government. They're never going to hit what they gave fossil fuel. So let's just not forget that. And fossil fuel is still, according to very credible groups, getting about five trillion a trillion, capital T, trillion dollars of subsidies a year globally. What can individuals do? Um, also, adopt new technologies. Like, just keep an open eye. Get out there. And a key part of that is this. You've got to be effective. You've got to be informed. Like, you know, for, for, for the older folks in here, you know, you don't have to go to school. It's, it's right in front of you. It's on your, on your iPhone. Um, just uh, Google, YouTube. There's amazing stuff out there. And we're going to have some links to that. Um, 
shift your career into the energy field. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to have to hang off of a windmill or be climbing on roofs for solar panels. We need legal help. We need marketing help. We need everything. I mean, everything you can imagine in the economy needs to go into the renewable energy. This will be, and no economist that I've talked to doesn't say it will be the largest employer in the world. Nothing's going to come close. This is, this is going to be huge. It's going to represent about 20% of the global economy. Um, and it's going like this. It's already enormous. Um, we got to encourage young people to get into the clean energy field, and that's really critical. Um, uh, we also need more schools, um, and this is um, really important. Uh, the, our education system isn't there yet. Can you imagine if someone came to you and said, what do you have a degree in? Oh, I got a degree in energy. It just, just doesn't sound right. You can have a business degree, or uh, you can have a degree in culinary arts, but an energy degree doesn't even sound right. We're, we're, we're just not quite there yet, and I'm, I'm not sure why. It's, it's currently the you know, energy is the largest part of the global economy. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure why we, we don't have more, but encouraging people to get, get, get into it. Join local energy committees. Like, that is a great way to network and get involved. Um, and, um, you know, I put up Clean Energy New Hampshire here, which is a group I was involved with since day one and uh, has become, you know, quite a powerhouse in the state. Um, what does it look like in the future? Here's the last slide. Great. Need to see more. Okay, why this is way lower cost? Like this is one of the things that drives me nuts. You know, we can get a little bit political here. Uh, you know, Republicans. I don't need to talk about. We know that they've been a little weird about this clean energy transmission uh, transition. But also the Democrats. Like they keep talking about, we have to make this investment to save the planet. No, we got to make this investment so we can reduce the costs. And, and yeah, we'll save the planet at the same time too, but jeepers, like you got everyone freaked out here. This is a good thing. We want to do this. Uh, predictable costs. This is really, really important. The renewable energy economy doesn't rely on what's happening out in the external world. You know, the solar panel costs exactly the same amount, you know, no matter what, what's happening. Um, once you buy it, you own it. Like the electricity comes out of it. Super predictable costs. Uh, vastly cleaner. Now, this isn't just CO2. We've got, you know, there's a quarter of a trillion dollars just in the U.S. spent on asthma directly related to burning of fuels, overwhelmingly fossil fuels. Um, it's more convenient. Like, uh, you know, an LED light bulb is way cooler. You don't have to have these fancy cooled sockets that can just screw in anywhere. They're getting to the point where you can stick them on walls and, and you can be battery operated. The Jaffrey Airport that's got you know, solar cells on lights. It was way cheaper to light that thing because it wasn't lit before they got that repaved. Um, and uh, they put these things, you just pound it in with a stake and, and there's your light. Um, no conduits, no electrical hookups. Um, so there's just all these conveniences. Electric cars, they pre-warm themselves. It, 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 you know, there's no oil changes. I've had an electric car for 130,000 miles and, and I've spent um, uh, up till recently $40. At, it was 10 years old. Finally, I did have to buy a battery. That was a gulp. But, but the, the, um, uh, short of that, I spent nothing but uh, $40 on the car. Never took it in for service. Um, uh, much, much safer, and this is both nationally and globally, uh, and for individuals. Questions? And, and I think ask questions, too, about like uh, anything to do with energy. It doesn't have to be about this. So, and, and it can be politically charged anything. Hit me with it. And for people who are participating online, use the chat line. And uh, Ed, let us know if you have some questions. Uh, who would like to start? Please just stand up and ask your question. Well, speak up. OK. Uh, question your little magic box. Yeah, so what's in the magic box? Um, so the, the, the system we're putting together is, is three primary components. One is a, a heat pump, and I, I really dislike that name immensely, but that's the technical term. We'll, we'll hopefully have some marketing people uh, uh, massage that. Um, so very, very similar to what would be in your refrigerator or air conditioner, but, but a very, very advanced and very efficient part. So that can shift from either cooling or heating the house. Um, the, the, the other part on the inside of your house that, that part that looked like a hot water tank will also provide hot water, but that's a storage unit. And that just helps the whole heat pump system run a lot more efficiently and take advantage of um, highs and lows in electric prices, because eventually, hopefully, we're going to be getting into more dynamic pricing. 
Uh, and thirdly is this engine that we've been working on with NASA if, as, as an option, um, which is using a closed loop Brayton cycle. So what that is, is it's basically a jet engine like on an airplane, except you bring the exhaust right back around to the intake and use a bunch of heat exchangers um, and then just get rid of the fuel altogether inside. And then we have a non-combusting heat source so we can use any kind of renewable energy. It can use fossil fuel too. Um, to w w for, w for literally a twentieth of the emissions of a typical generator, uh, make uh, energy and in total silence, so you won't have any idea it's running. And one of the sort of keys of that um, that we're looking at is is something to help back up the grid. So we make a deal with someone and say, look, you buy this generator, we'll let's say give you free whatever we got to give people to allow us just to turn it on when we need to turn it on, uh, and then we can sell that service to the grid. Well, that's basically it. Hi, Dave Feltay. Um, the, the electrical grid, uh, in terms of wires and poles and, and all that that go across the country, how do you see the future of that? Uh, I mean, that's got to be a big part of it. Yeah, so yeah, definitely. So the electric grid and, and, and efficiency is, is, is really important. Now, now first, to understand when I went through the slides, you notice I didn't put any loss on the grid. The, the grid itself has some loss, but it's, it's, it's really amazingly small. Uh, it's mostly at the power plant. But we've got to move all this electricity around, and, and we may have a lot more electricity. Um, you know, so if we electrify cars and then we electrify our heating, it's a lot more. That is actually the primary reason we're developing, in conjunction with NASA, this engine that will go in there. We think is necessary to be in there. So when the cold, cold day comes, we don't have enough electricity in the town of Jaffrey to heat the houses. That's a promise. And who's going to come up with that electricity? Where is it going to come from? Uh, we did a quick study internally, and the state of Maine did a similar study to figure out what would happen to New England. And we'd need the equivalent of 40 Seabrook nuclear power plants to back up heat pumps. You know, no, no one's going to do that. That's not happening. So that's part of why we want to do it. And what we're doing is called a shared asset. So you might say, if I can offer you this thing for $4,000 more, you can get this backup generator. It's a lot cheaper than what you buy a jackup backup generator for now. And the reason we can do that is you don't have to install it. It comes with a machine. It uses the same electric, again, that dyslexic head. Like, why, why have a separate electric service? It, you know, that we need the electric for the heat pump so we can kick out the electric for this. That solves that problem. And then it could be kicked on, let's say, in high demand or when the wind and, you know, because like right now as the wind and solar becomes a much bigger and it's becoming a very serious part of the grid, which has been exciting to watch for me. I mean, I have it right on a map in my uh, phone here to, to see how much is, is happening. But as we all know, you know, it's like weather is our fuel. And when that weather goes away, uh, we we got to have some backup, and, and I still think fuel is going to be it personally, and that's a guess. That's, that's not a promise. It's not a fact, but I think fuel is going to still be important, and as I point to the waste issue, we don't want to get rid of all fuel. We won't know what to do with the waste then. Um, uh, hopefully, we can just get rid of the waste, and then we'll come up with electric-derived fuels. Uh, batteries will be part of that too. I, I personally think that like this idea that we got to put trillions and trillions of dollars into our grid is, is, is not correct. If you go back to those original charts, if you don't count this massive drop in the amount of energy we're going to need, then yeah, we would need this huge investment. But, but the fact is we're going to be using a tiny, tiny fraction of the energy we use today, and our grid can handle a lot of that. Yes, there'll be investment, new investment, uh, but there's been ongoing investment anyway. And that investment, by the way, is going to be a heck of a lot cheaper than running the current system. Yes, uh, online. Yeah, DBS Baraga asks, do you have an estimate on when you will be ready for the market? Yeah, <laughs> um, I appreciate that. I, I wish it was yesterday. Um, uh, we, we hope to have products in the market. They'll probably go uh, to um, industrial uh, commercial uses first, uh, just because it's a little easier to enter the market that way. But we, we hope to have units up and running here in 18 to 24 months. Um, and then as, as quick and aggressively as we can move to get, get that technology then into um, a consumer. So conceivably three years from now. Charles. Uh, Steve, uh, the, the pie chart uh, that you showed early on showing sources of energy, if you look in your crystal ball 25 or 30 years, I'm not going to be around to see it, but what would your vision be of the pie chart? 
Yeah, so I think actually you, you will hopefully be around for this because I think it's gonna happen a lot faster than that and, and, uh, and you're gonna live longer than that. Let's be positive, Charlie. And, and, uh, and, and um, so solar and wind is gonna be a monster. Um, you know, we're, we're, the US has had a, this weird thing with offshore wind and a complicated mess with, uh, you know, the Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket wind or whatever they called it. Um, they finally are getting going. I think this year we're finally putting in the offshore wind. We only have five offshore windmills in the whole US. By all rights, we should have probably about 10,000. So, and we can ultimately have 20 or 30 or 40,000, and these will be out of sight. Like these can be way, way offshore. So I think that's gonna be big. And then solar, so solar, if you just watch the curve, um, to just throw numbers out to those that like to follow this, our entire electric system right now can produce one terawatt of power at peak. If we turned on absolutely everything the whole US has, if we just keep the curve of solar going exactly on what it is now, 10 years from now, it's gonna be able to produce a terawatt on a sunny day. So we're talking about a lot of energy here. It's going from this little teeny, teeny slice to this really, really big slice very quickly. And um, so Massachusetts at times is now hitting 50, 60, 70% of all electricity coming from renewables on an ideal day. That was just a couple percent just a few years ago. So I mean, it, it's all about the curve. Like my brain thinks in curves and dynamic yeah, we don't do that enough. I mean, I, you know, I grew up in the shadow of Polaroid headquarters, speaking of a company that wasn't watching curves, and it was called Moore's Law and what a microchip was going to do to digital photography, and they blew their company up. We're, watch the curve. Like, I think it's going to be enormous. We also have all these other technologies coming, so I think nuclear could still play a, a major role in this. Uh, I'm not an anti-nuclear person. I think it was a mistake shutting the plant down in Vermont unless there really were true safety issues. Um, nuclear actually turns out to be the safest energy we've got. Its problem isn't safety, its problem isn't waste either. I could go on to a whole lecture on that. The real problem is cost. It, it's the most expensive energy. It's the most highly subsidized energy we got. So Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant, you could argue, is probably about 90% subsidized. And only 10% do we pay through in our, in our, uh, uh, directly through rates. It's been spread out through all kinds of things, including lawsuits. Um, uh, but we have these modular nuclear that's coming, so I think that could at least keep nuclear where it is. It, it, it doesn't have to go away. Some of these plants will eventually have to be shut down. They're old. Uh, and we also need more responsive power um, from them, and these plants were not designed to go up and down. Can we go back to with pellets and biomass? Yeah. Because that's, you know, it's so local. And is it clean, in your opinion? What is some of the political arguments and where the technology yeah. is with yeah. Excuse me. Repeat the question. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a question on uh, uh, biomass and pellets in particular, and and is it clean? Is that is that could I start with that? Yeah. And where it fits. Yeah. So is it clean and where it fits? Yeah. So there there has been. Um, so uh, I can I, I won't do it because I'm being taped right now, but uh, I can name names. There was a particular coal company in West Virginia that funded the scientists that first came out to try to show that um, biomass was not um, a carbon neutral fuel. We're the only country, now part of Australia, very coal rich, by the way, um, that has decided that it isn't carbon neutral. All of the EU, Kyoto Protocol, every protocol out there does look at it with some rules. Um, you can't just go, you know, cutting forests down and then say it's it, 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 it's it's uh, CO2 neutral. That that doesn't count. Um, and you also have got to burn it appropriately. Uh, we kind of associate burning wood as being kind of a little dirty, smelly, and and, and yeah, and some like the the, the smell, but it, it's not healthy. Polycyclic aromatics, if you want to get into it, and and the the uh, the the. But it can be burned. We had uh, systems that I was running in my lab without any exhaust going anywhere. There was unmeasurable carbon monoxide. You couldn't smell anything. You couldn't see anything coming out of the combustion. So there's that. And on the CO2 thing, it's, it's really simple. There's an enormous waste stream, and my past company is consuming waste. So that was going to be emitting carbon on the spot. In fact, some of them we were delaying the carbon because we were shutting incinerators down. We were shutting landfills down. The other thing is the EU, and especially in Sweden, they did a big study to find out that um, it actually, they look at it as it can, can be carbon negative because if you landfill wood, uh, it produces a lot of methane, and that's much worse. So depends how you want to look at it. Not an advocate for cutting trees down for biomass, but that it, 
does happen, but it's extremely rare. And, and, and unfortunately, certain scientists that have been backed by some not nice people are out there saying things that are just really misleading. Um, I'm still a fan, even though I'm competing now with biomass, I'm gonna, here to tell you it's a really important part, and if we stop using it for fuel, I don't, it would just be a mess. I don't know where we'd put it all. How about that? It's got a question. Yes, online. Uh, Jim uh, Hessinger asks, what about uh, residential wind options down the road? Yeah, so I, I think residential wind is, is interesting. It, it's had a hard time getting traction, but there are some new technologies that um, are starting more on a commercial basis, but really small scale that can kind of work off the tip of a taller building. And so that would be a first start. Um, for residential wind, I, I got a feeling, my guess, and again, this is strictly an opinion and a wild guess, um, that, that solar is probably gonna be so cost competitive that, that it's gonna be hard for, for residential wind to kick in. But for an enthusiast that, that can put a, a wind system up, I mean, look, all the power to you. Like, th this is still cheaper than electricity you're buying now, so if that's an option, do it. Um, uh, do it now. Uh, there's amazing windmills. Uh, we got a, a house down in Martha's Vineyard right off of shore there. There was this dilapidated house from the 70s, and it had this broken windmill, and somebody bought it, rebuilt the house. They put the windmill back up, and it's, like, way out on this peninsula, and that thing just screams. I, you don't hear it, by the way, but I just watch it spinning. I'm like, these guys could be mining Bitcoin out there. I don't, I don't know what they're doing with all the electricity. So I, at uh, uh, any rate, um, they're really amazing. Uh, a big fan, but, but they are expensive, um, and so it's, you know, for the right person in the right place, it's a, it's a great option. Yes, last question. Do you see any storage of electricity being improved as part of this, uh, this phenomenon? Yeah, so, so, so electricity storage, and, and um, um, that's been a really hot topic later, lately. Um, so, so, you know, batteries, which, by the way, don't actually store electricity. They convert it chemically and then convert it back into electricity really quite efficiently. So that's what a lithium-ion battery is, cadmium battery, lead acid, what have you. Um, doesn't, there's no actual electrons in the battery, just, just a little, little detail. I try to educate when I can. Um, but um, we have seen the cost of lithium-ion batteries go from $1,000, forget what the unit is, because uh, down to about $200. But it doesn't take a, a really sophisticated MBA to realize that there's a massive demand for these batteries. You've got brand new plants. Nothing's depreciated yet. You're paying for patents. You're paying for all this stuff. A lot of people are saying that actual price could be about a quarter of that if you just let everything calm down for a minute. Um, so that starts getting really real. That's, by the way, what makes electric cars fly. They're going to be cheaper than gas cars. There's absolutely no question in my mind. And I think anyone that wants to bet against that, I'm, I'm happy to bet. Um, the, the, that's coming. As far as like the grid, it's a little more complicated. It's got to get way, way cheaper. So fuel, by the way, you can kind of think of as a battery. And right now, the tank and fuel you can buy for about 25 cents using the same metric of $1,000 down to $200. So a tank of fuel is 25 cents. Um, and that's per kilowatt hour to anyone that wants to um, uh, back up my numbers here. And the, the, um, but there are technologies now that one thing that the grid has an advantage of, and your house for that matter, and that's really where I think the storage should be, because that's a dual use of not, um, to, to, to the earlier question about what are we going to do with the grid. If, if we do, like, I'm not a fan of, like, these huge battery things they're putting at substations or whatever. I, I, th I guess it's the most convenient thing to do now. It should be spread out. Uh, one, you know, lightning hits those two. Uh, and, and it generally hits in one place, not lots of places, and so it'd be a lot safer. It also has a dual use of not burdening the distribution system of our electric grid. So the price of uh, one company right now that just received a healthy chunk of a billion dollars, say they got it down to $7 uh, using the same number uh, per kilowatt hour, that starts being extremely meaningful to the grid. We will definitely get solar and wind to go 24 hours a day. The, the harder question is, what do we do seasonally? So, uh, you know, New Hampshire here, uh, we're not getting a lot of solar in the last week, that's for sure. Okay. Uh, Joe, will you ask, what kinds of storage, meaning energy storage, do you imagine as playing major roles in New England? Um, I, I think all of the above. And, and, and so we've got all kinds of technologies I could talk to in, in depth. Um, <laughs> 
and, and, and one of them is like the $6 battery. I mean, they're using all different chemistries, and I, I just, it's a little too much to, to talk about now. But one of the storages that we don't really think about is even our own buildings. So we're all going to leave this building tonight, and, and it's going to be just sitting here and presumably kept at some temperature. Well, our little unit, which is going to be smart, and there's other companies working on smart units, will be connected to the grid and, and be thinking for you, and you can actually use a building as a battery. Like, we, we, we have it. It's called thermal mass. And so knowing that heat is going to be a major, major part of the electric consumption, uh, at least that's what I'm presuming, um, the, the, um, we could take a building like this, and it from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., I mean, who, who cares if the temperature goes down a little, as long as you don't do what my dad did and freeze all the pipes. So, so we, we can use that as batteries. And, and, and I could go on a long, long list of sort of batteries we have. We also have all these cars that are going to come out, and I think that's going to be really important, having a two-way relationship with the grid and cars, which, which is you know, technically really easy to do, by the way. Um, the, the, and and I, I think Rivian does it, like it comes packaged that way. I don't know why Tesla doesn't do that uh, yet, but I, I know it's easy. Uh, so there must be a, a, a safety reason or something they're worried about. Um, that, that will become really important. The average car in the United States is only being used... Um, three and a half percent of the time. So all the rest of that time, it could be theoretically connected to the grid, whether you're parked at work, whether you're parked at home, uh, it's parked somewhere. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and show me a parking spot that doesn't have an electric line anywhere near it. I mean, that's pretty rare. So, so that's gonna be a really important part. So it's these, when you start thinking about energy storage, think about all these other things that aren't necessarily directly a new battery to store electricity specifically for the grid, but buildings, electric cars, uh, this goes into a lot of manufacturing processes. You know, our Jaffrey plant there, I mean, one of the reasons the electric um, utility attracted us up here, you know, we had a, we had a million dollar a year electric bill there. Um, you know, we would have been happy to, to run our presses harder certain times if you just gave us a little incentive to do it. So a huge amount of our industrial base can act like a battery too. So, so it's about using existing, I always like dual purposing uh, infrastructure and not building a whole bunch of new infrastructure if you can avoid it. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming today. I want to just take a minute, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and acknowledge Ed Watazek over here. Yeah. And I want everyone to know that he is a volunteer, and the equipment is his equipment. And he drives from Chelmsford? <laughs> so I think he is entitled at least to honorary residency in Jaffrey New Hampshire. Uh, thanks also to David Beltet, who's the chair of the board of the Jaffrey Civic Center and a great supporter of this series, and of course to Becca Fredrickson who runs this shop, and finally of course to the man whom I called an idealistic entrepreneur, and I think that label fits. Steve, it's been a pleasure listening to you. I'm still not sure I know the difference between a chisel and a screwdriver, <laughs> but Fair I boy. learned a good deal today. You've aroused my curiosity, and I'm sure that of everyone in the room. Please stay. Steve will be around. We can talk a little more offline, as they say. Thanks again. Now, February 3rd, we will continue. David Macy, the resident director of the McDowell Colony, will be here to share stories. And I think it will be quite a change from today's program, but an interesting one. And thanks for your stories. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.